Welcome back to ECE 340, next to the last lecture, and then you'll have homeworks and exams is all that's left. You have homework number nine is due today, homework 10 is due the next time we meet on Tuesday or it's due that day. The final exam is, wow getting lost on dates. Two weeks from yesterday, is that correct? The 8th of May, which is a Wednesday, and it's at 1 o'clock, so make sure your calendar is adjusted to do a Wednesday exam instead of a Tuesday or Thursday exam, and it will be in this room. I haven't yet verified this review session. I'll try to verify that before Tuesday's class, and stay tuned to the D2L website in terms of office hours. If you're interested in office hours, I'll try to have some of those after the last day of class. I'll have one on Wednesday at the normal time, and I think I'm planning to have my normal office hour on reading day, which is a week from today at the normally scheduled time. Then I'll probably have things on Monday, but Tuesday don't plan on seeing me on that day before the exam. Wednesday I might have sort of a last minute office hour if you have last minute questions, but let's try to get your questions answered by the review session or after the review session. Today what I want to talk about is really focusing on sampling and how fast do we sample and what happens if we sample at a rate that is not consistent with this Nyquist frequency. You've probably heard of that, maybe you've already played with it some, but I hope after today's class that you feel a little bit more comfortable with where did it come from and what happens if you don't sample at the Nyquist frequency. Then we will get some aliasing and I want you to be able to determine those frequencies, those apparent frequencies. I'll go through an example where it's really a 9 hertz waveform, but it appears to be coming in at 1 hertz. And how is that happening? And that's all a result of not sampling fast enough relative to the Nyquist rate. We will also talk a little bit about anti-aliasing filters and finding and computing the parent frequency in many different ways. We'll talk about folding, we'll talk about translating, etc. Hopefully one of those ways will click in terms of how do I figure out what I'm going to see if I sample at this frequency and these are the frequencies that are contained in the original waveform or the original signal. That's where I would like to go or that's the plan for today. Here is really just a recap of what I stated in the first part of our goal. The Nyquist frequency, if you have a band-limited signal where the highest frequency in that signal is omega sub h, whatever, so if you're thinking of audio frequencies, maybe you would say, oh, omega sub h is related to f sub h, where f sub h is 20,000 hertz that's now band limited. You, we aren't going to hear any more than that, so we could restrict our attention to only that interval of frequencies from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. The highest frequency then determines what we better sample at, and we need to sample at least twice the highest frequency. Pictorially, we should be getting comfortable with this frequency domain picture. This triangle shape is not important. That's just trying to show that it has non-zero values between DC and omega sub H. And the bandwidth here is omega sub H. If somebody gave you an omega sub H, maybe it was 100 radians per second, you would have a bandwidth of 100 radians per second you would then want to sample twice that frequency. 
more than 200 radians per second is what you would want to sample. That's the sampling frequency, but you can relate that to the sample period by 2 pi f, and f being 1 over t, then it's 2 pi over cap t. And now you know, whoa, if somebody gives a band-limited signal, you know how fast to sample that. It's more than twice the highest frequency. And that's as slow as you want to sample if you're trying to preserve all the frequency content in your signal that you're sampling. That's what I'm trying to say. If you now have a bandwidth of 100 radians per second, you better be sampling beyond 200 radians per second if you're going to keep those frequencies at their specific frequency that they start at. If you don't sample fast enough, then we'll see how those actually sort of appear to be something else. And that's what's called either an alias or an apparent frequency. That's where some frequency actually looks like something else. That's the alias. Or it appears to be something else. What I want to do now is discuss where does this Nyquist frequency, omega sub n, come from. And we have the tools now to talk about sampling. We haven't been doing a lot with sampling, but now that you know the continuous time material, hopefully quite well, you can now take that into the discrete time domain. And the discrete time a lot of times then is created by sampling a continuous time waveform. Schematically, this is what we have. We now have a continuous time signal, let's say x of t, but we actually want to change that or only worry about the particular values of that continuous time waveform every capital T units of time. And that's what this schematic is showing. That switch is closing every capital T units of time, and every time it closes, we get another number. And we're going to assume that we have infinite resolution in the amplitude space, so we're not worrying about quantizing that waveform, that x of t, in terms of its value or magnitude. What we're interested in is this conversion from continuous time to a sampled waveform, x of little n capital T. Pictorially, if we needed to look at that, If somebody said, oh, here is our x of t, what we have now done relative to that analog waveform, here is our time axis, we have now broken that down into chunks. Or you could think of this as you're taking a snapshot, every capital T units of time this point we would now pull off, and that could be little x of 0 cap t, or x of 0. This point would be then x of 1 times cap t. And sometimes we might just call that x of 1. And you would have to then have your capital T on the side. You would have to know what that 1 meant relative to maybe the absolute time axis. If capital T was one millisecond and somebody said, oh, that's your first sampled value after the time zero, then you would say, oh, that's x of one or that's x of one millisecond. This point then, x of 2t, x of 3t, and we would like to know how fine 
do we need to make this capital T so that we can essentially reconstruct the blue line or preserve all the information in that original signal X of T. And capital T we've been calling or will call the sampling period and that's related to the sampling frequency in hertz of F sub S. Now, what we want to do is come up with a way to analyze this information. We have the original signal, little x of t. We've now converted that into a sequence of numbers. It's no longer a continuous waveform. Now we just have these strings of numbers hitting us, and we know that those strings are separated in time by the sampling period, capital T. We could rewrite this, then, that process, as an expression. We could say our sampled signal, x sub s of t, is actually our original continuous time waveform times some sampling waveform. P of t is now going to be our sampling waveform. We want to build that up so that it essentially pulls off only values of our original signal at capital T units of time, every capital T. This is now our original continuous time signal. And X sub S is our sampled signal. And we want to know how are these different waveforms related? And how, if they're related in a set, certain way, maybe that will give us some insight into how small we need to pick capital T. How fine do we need to sample? And we already know the answer from the back of the book. We know we need to sample twice as fast as the highest frequency in our waveform. What we can do is we can now describe we know what x of t is. That's our original continuous time signal. But p of t, let's just go ahead and model that as an ideal sampling waveform. p of t. But I'm going to now describe that as a combination of impulses. Pictorially, what this is really saying is that's saying that now I have an impulse. If you would evaluate that at cap uh, little n equal to zero, we have all of these little n's from minus infinity to infinity. And that's going to now separate the argument of that impulse by capital T units of time. If we look at n equal to zero, this is now just the impulse. And the impulse is something that happens right at the origin, and we usually label it as having one for its weight, the area underneath that impulse. The impulse is infinitely tall. But this is now an ideal sampling waveform. If we would hit this x of t with just this impulse, we would pull off the value of that x of t right at the origin, at time t equals zero. And what we're doing now is we're saying we want to extend that concept to where we have this chain or train of impulse waveforms that occur every capital T units of time, or that's how far apart they are separated. That's our P of T, and the summation is just a way to
express that as an equation. Pictorially, this is what's happened. If we hit or multiply this P of T times our X of T, then we're only going to see X values at these integer multiples of the sampling period capital T. We're just going to pull those off, and that's going to perform the operation that we want. Now that we have P of T, let's put some restrictions on X, our original waveform. Let's just suppose that X of T, that's our original continuous time waveform. Let's assume that one is band limited. If I now ask you to sketch a picture that would sort of illustrate this band limited nature of X of T, do you see what you could sketch or what domain you might be using to sketch your diagram? This means that X of T only contains or is composed of a finite interval, or maybe you like to think of it as a region in the frequency domain, of frequencies. Meaning we could sketch that Let's just say that it has an amplitude at DC of capital M, and this is now our magnitude of the frequency response. By band limited, we are just meaning that this interval is finite. Remember what we had. We have this continuous time waveform, blue X of T. We now multiply it by this ideal sampling waveform, and that allows us to then just capture this sequence of numbers that represent the sampled values of X of T every capital T units of time. We are trying to relate little x of t and little x sub s of t in some way. And really the way that we're trying to do it is in their frequency content. We've now introduced this ideal sampling waveform, p of t. Can we say anything about p of t that might help us in this analysis process in terms of getting a handle on another way of describing maybe the frequency content of little p of t? Suppose you're studying for the final, and somebody goes, oh, here's P of T, and they go, so, is there anything peculiar about it? And now what you're trying to do is think of, well, how have we modeled signals? What, what is happening with P of T? It's happening routinely, isn't it? It's periodic. Oh, it's periodic. Wake up. It's chapter 6, right? Anything that's periodic means what? Now we have a Fourier series. So we should be able to model this by a Fourier series. Knowing that it's periodic, now we can say, oh, let's do the analysis relative to Fourier series. That's what we can say about P of T. So what can be said about P of T? It is periodic. 
As soon as we conclude that, and we also can identify the period, that's pretty clear. It has a period of capital T. Now we can say, oh, P of T can be rewritten as a Fourier series. Or P of T has a Fourier series representation. In anticipation of the final, what's the synthesis form of the Fourier series? Or how do we write P of T in terms of a Fourier series? How many Fourier series have we talked about in this class? Maybe three. We had a trigonometric Fourier series. We had a compact trigonometric Fourier series, and we had a complex exponential Fourier series. Let's do the complex exponential Fourier series with P of T. If little p of t has a complex exponential Fourier series, we can then rewrite that as this sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity of d sub n. Those are our coefficients that scale these complex exponentials. We're just now combining sinusoids to try to build up this train of impulse functions. That's what we're doing. What's omega sub s? If you wanted partial credit, you could write that down, right? And I told you, you need to remember this formula until you retire. Omega is 2 pi f. Okay, now I'm searching for more partial credit. But f is related to the sampling period. So this is now just because our sampling frequency in hertz is 1 over t. And we know what t is. That's, every, that's how far apart these, sample, these impulse waveforms are. We know how far apart they are, that gives us f sub s. Once we have f sub s, we can get omega sub s. Now we know the frequencies of these sinusoids that we're going to combine to build up this train of impulses. So now we have these signs and we have harmonics of omega sub s. That's what little n tells us. Little n tells us we have 1 omega sub s, 2 omega sub s, 3 omega sub s, etc. That separation is what gives us all of that. What's missing in this expression right now are these weights. How do we weight these sinusoids? Can we find d sub n? And d sub n is just the other half of the Fourier series derivation. That's the analysis piece. How do we now analyze the amount of each frequency or harmonic in this series expansion for P of T? The analysis question says that we have d sub n. We're integrating over one period, aren't we? to find that d sub n, and so we divide out that period. We're integrating from minus t over 2 to t over 2 if we want. We have p of t e to the minus j in omega sub s t dt. We now see how P of T is correlated with each of these sinusoids. How does P of T align with those sinusoids? Now we need to find D sub n. But remember what we're doing. P of T is this. Now we have to integrate this an infinite number of times. 
Not quite, because now all we have to do is focus on one period. And we decided to make our period of interest go from minus t over 2 to t over 2. Meaning now down here in this integral to find d of n, this p of t is this sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity of delta of t minus nt. But if we're only integrating from minus capital T over 2 to capital T over 2, the only one of these that's going to be there is that one right at t equals 0. All the others are gone from that integration of finding capital B sub n these coefficients that are weighting the exponentials. Let's now use that information to try to find d sub n. d sub n is 1 over cap t, integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2. I'm going to do it the long way just so that you see what I've done. Not sure why I put that S subscript, so, oh, no, I'm going to take it off. Hopefully what you understood from my previous argument that that infinite number of terms simplifies down to just the one right at the origin, at time t equals 0. We can neglect, or this integral essentially eliminates, because of the limits of the integral, it eliminates all of those other impulses that are away or outside of this one period interval. And now we can go baking. What I always think of homemade pies when I see this. No, I don't think of sinks. I don't like to do the dishes, so I don't usually like sinks. Oh, that's S I N C, isn't it? But good, good idea. But now. If I'm thinking of pies, baked pies, if you're really doing this from scratch, you may get this flour in the old days, so I guess this predates you guys. We used to have to sift flour. So now you can buy it in the grocery store and you click on it and it says pre-sifted. So when you do that, you can go, look, this had an impulse and an integral on it before we bought it because it's pre-sifted. But now we have, what does this mean if I say this is now going to utilize this sifting behavior? What happens when we have an impulse in the argument of an integral? This whole thing is only going to be of interest at the instant when this impulse is active. And the only time this impulse is active is when its argument is zero. In this case, the argument is zero when t is equal to zero. But if this was happened to be delta of t minus, let's say, capital T over 4, then this whole thing would say, oh, pull out what's left from the integral and evaluate that at little t equal to capital T over 4 because the argument of this impulse was t minus capital T over 4. And I want to know when is that argument equal to 0. That's when the impulse hurt, hits. In this case, the impulse hits right at the origin. That's when the argument is 0. <clears throat> 
So now we have pies and broken hands. We need to get some, maybe some hot pads. Then it wouldn't have hurt so bad. And now I'm really hungry. Now we know how to handle this, right? We go apple pie, and immediately it falls out. We now can say that that entire integral is just going to be the argument e to the minus j n omega sub s when that impulse turns on, and that's when t, little t, is equal to zero. Now we have e to the zero, and that's one. Meaning, all of these d sub n's are just equal to 1 over t. They're a constant. And what's 1 over t? Another way of writing it is f sub s. Now we know that to build up this infinite chain of impulses, we really just need to know what's the sampling period, capital T. Once we know that, now we know what the d sub n coefficients are. They're 1 over cap t. And we know the frequency omega sub s. Now we know how to build up or weight all of these frequencies, and we know the frequencies to use in those exponentials. Here's now the rewritten form of P of T. P of T is now this sum of D sub n, but you know what? This D sub n is not a function of little n anymore, is it? It's independent of the index. I'm going to write that out front. That's F sub s. Then I have this sum from little n equal to minus infinity to infinity of all of these complex exponentials. And again, just as a reminder, omega sub s is 2 pi over capital T, where omega sub s is 2 pi f sub s. And this now is our complex... exponential Fourier series expansion of P of T. And that is supposed to help us in our subsequent analysis. Now we have another way of writing this infinite chain of impulses. That's all this is. Pictorially, this is just this train of impulse functions, and that's really being used to sample this continuous time waveform x of t. Now let's, now that we know little p of t, let's Fourier transform little x sub s, just for grins. Let's now see if we can find the frequency content. That's one of the reasons we like to go into the frequency domain and use Fourier, either transforms or series. Let's now look at the Fourier transform of x sub s of t. Because we don't know whether this is periodic or not, so let's just say it's not. This is just this train of numbers that are samples of little x of t. In terms of the Fourier transform, now let's call that capital X sub s of omega. By definition, that's this time domain integral from minus infinity to infinity of x sub s of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And now we're saying how is x sub s correlated with these complex exponentials. And omega now is a continuous variable, continuous function of frequency. What is x sub s? Well, we can rewrite that as x sub t and p of t. We have x of t. We don't know what that is. That's just some generic waveform. But we do know p of t. P of t now, we said, was f sub s 
sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity of e to the j in omega sub s t. That's now x sub s of t. We now weight that by e to the minus j in, whoops, no n in this one. It's just e to the minus j omega t dt. The integral is only worried about time, and the little n's are not functions of time. So we can pull all of that summation, the f sub s we can pull out, and just leave the other pieces inside the integral. Meaning we can now rewrite this as f sub s, a sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity of this integral. So this is just our x sub s of t. Now we have this integral that has x of t. And you know what? It has some exponentials. Why don't I just combine their exponents? I now have e to the minus j omega minus n omega sub s t dt. That's just performing some algebra on that exponent. So I had e to the minus j omega t. I have e to the minus j omega t and then I have plus j n omega sub s t. I've just rewritten that mess into a cleaner mess. But now this should look pretty familiar. If this was just x of t e to the minus j omega t dt, that would be the Fourier transform of little x of t. And we could call that capital x of omega. But instead of omega, we have just a little bit more involved expression. Meaning now, well, really all we have is capital X of this expression of omega, omega minus n omega sub s. Meaning we can now call this entire piece of the integral X, capital X of omega minus n omega sub s. Does everybody see what I'm doing? So now this is going, it can be something related. We could be thinking about the discrete Fourier transform, and but that's not where I want to take it just yet, okay? What I want to do now, though, is use this notation to replace all of this integral. And now what I have is this infinite sum with capital X in it. I now have the Fourier transform of the sampled waveform equal to F sub S times this infinite sum of capital X of omega minus N omega sub S. Which if we wanted to think about that, let's just sketch that. What is that? Well, I like to just plug in particular values for little n. If I plugged in little n equal to zero, this would be capital X of omega. And we know what capital X of omega is. What we're trying to sketch now is the magnitude of capital X sub S. But the very first one that's centered at DC is now F sub S. We said capital X of omega had a magnitude of M at DC, and we said that it was band limited. Did I say omega sub H and minus omega sub H? 
Now what else do we have? Now we can go over here and say little n equal to 1, and now what I have is I have this is omega minus omega sub s, meaning it's just this same picture translated omega sub s in frequency. Meaning I can now sketch this to look exactly like that other triangular shape, where this endpoint, what's the value of that endpoint? It's omega sub h less than omega sub s, isn't it? So this is now omega sub s minus omega sub h. And this point is omega sub h beyond omega sub s. And if you look at this expression, hopefully it's clear that now all I'm doing is I'm copying. Now I've gone to the copy center and I'm copying this triangular wave shape at each sampling frequency omega sub s. So I could go over here and say 2 omega sub s, and I have this same picture. I could go back here and say minus omega sub s. I now have that same picture. Minus 2 omega sub s, and I have that same picture. And this just goes on and on. That's what that infinite sum says. Questions? Does everybody see what we've done? We've now found a graphical picture of how the original Fourier transform of our continuous time signal, little x of t, is now related to the sampled version of that same signal. By sampling, what have we done? Now we've duplicated the frequency response at integer multiples of the sampling frequency. That's the result of sampling. By sampling, now we've just copied this frequency behavior at integer multiples of omega sub s. What we want to do is we would like to just re retain what's happening in the bandwidth of interest. We want to reclaim the information in little x of t from little x sub s of t. And we could do that if we could simply isolate on this guy. But in order for this to look the same as what we started with, we better not have these two ends, omega sub h and omega sub s minus omega sub h, overlapping. If those start overlapping, then we've started mixing things, and we don't like that. We've been, we're starting to mix frequency behavior. So to preserve the frequency content, we actually need omega sub s minus omega sub h to exceed omega sub h. So that now we need omega sub s to be bigger than twice omega sub h. And that was our goal. That was our answer in the book, back of the book. We now can conclude that we need omega sub s greater than 2 omega sub h. And this is what we were calling the Nyquist frequency omega sub n. We've now derived that result. By sampling, that now copies things. It copies the frequency content. And where does it place those copies? On the frequency axis. At integer multiples of omega sub s. This now gives us the information that we need. We now need, or therefore, we need to sample twice as fast 
as the highest frequency signal component in X of T. If somebody now says, oh, I need you to sample this waveform, you better be starting to ask some questions about what's the frequency content in this waveform that we're sampling. And if you can now restrict the bandwidth or the frequency content of that signal, now you know the minimum value that you need to sample. What we want to look at now is what happens if we don't sample fast enough. And that's going to cause aliasing. What if we do have these tails overlapping? What if we do not sample <coughs> above the Nyquist frequency? What's going to happen? Let's look at an example and see if we can figure it out. Here's a question. What frequencies will we see when somebody says, oh, here's a waveform, x of t, and it's 4 cosine of 3t plus 5 cosine of 8t. And now they tell us that they're going to sample that at a sampling frequency omega sub s of 10 radians per second. And now we want to see what frequencies are we going to see in the resulting sampled waveform. What frequencies are present in X of T just to begin with? 3 and 8, right? You better be able to get that on the final if I gave you a question that easy or that nice. Now we know that we have frequencies at 3 and 8. But what did we say happens when we sample? Here's omega, and here's DC, and now I just said, oh, I have a frequency at 3, and I have a frequency at 8. I have the negative of that and there, right? That's what I have now in terms of frequency content. But what did I say happens? This Now what I want to do is I want to find what's the... So this right now, what I have sketched is without the subscript. Well, if I drew the lines in there. Oh, and I don't know why I gave them different amplitudes, but what's this line going to be? If this is the complex exponential, that's half of what it was, right? So that's 2, and this is now... Two and a half. We okay on that? That's capital X of omega's amplitude. But now if I sample that and I say, now sketch capital X sub S, now what do we see? What happens when we sample? We take this to the copy shop, don't we? Copy, not coffee. You could take it to the copy shop and work it, but we need to do it, take it to the copy shop first. We copy it, right? And where do we copy it? We now take a copy of this. We have 3 and 8, minus 3 and minus 8. If I copy this, where am I going to pin it down again? 
where do I start drawing those this should be the hint that you need every omega sub s I start laying down an identical copy don't I so now I need to go up to omega sub s which in this case in that example what did I say my sampling frequency was it was 10 so now I go over here to 10 and minus 10 and what do I do now I say well I need to put this minus 3 down centered at 10 it's going to appear where minus 3 below 10 which is at 7 right so I'm going to see something here that was really the copy of this guy is everybody okay with that where does this minus 8 go it's 8 to the left of 10 isn't it so that's going to be at 2 that's what was on the left now I need to go on the right if I wanted to and I need to go over here 3 so here is 13 and then where do I go to 18 does everybody see where those came from I simply copied the green lines and put them in over the first omega sub s and I would just keep doing that at 20 I would do that same picture at minus 10 I need to do that same picture why don't I do that in a different color now I go back here 3 and I go back 8 I also need to go over here 3 and minus 8 but now what am I going to actually see in my sampled waveform what frequencies am I going to see now my frequency domain space has frequencies at 2, 3, 7, 8, 13, 18 all of these copies doesn't it but what can I distinguish if I'm sampling at omega sub s what's the highest frequency that I can discern or make out if 10 needs to be bigger than 2 omega sub h the best I can hope for is figuring out frequencies between DC and 5 meaning now I can go back here luckily I still have some more colors and I can say the only thing I can look or distinguish is happening here and this we're going to call a special frequency I'm going to call that the folding frequency because if you look at taking this picture or this piece of paper and if you folded it right on that frequency this 7 would overlap with the 3 wouldn't it the 8 would overlap with the 2 and that's how we could have found this 2 if we wanted to before so this is now our folding frequency which is omega sub s over 2 which in this case is 5 and this was our omega sub s in other words instead of maybe going to the copy center we could simply write down our original frequencies 3 and 8 and then fold over the folding frequency and say oh that 8 is actually 3 beyond 5 so it's going to appear as 3 below 5 it's going to appear as a 2 questions on that pardon <laughs> 
Well, it's going to appear as 2 because all we can distinguish is 0 to 5. What are some points that we can draw from this? If we wanted to go back and say, well, how fast should we have sampled? In our original x of t, what would the Nyquist frequency be? It needs to be twice the highest, and the highest was actually 8, so we should have been, in order to preserve the original frequencies of 3 and 8, we should have been sampling at least 16 radians per second. And we weren't doing that. We sampled at 10. What was the other idea or concept that we introduced? That was the folding frequency. And this was equal to 10, wasn't it? Meaning, given an x, a little x, made up of all sorts of frequencies, you should be able to tell me what's the Nyquist frequency. And then if I give you a sampling frequency, you should be able to tell me what's the folding frequency. And then you can tell me what signals or frequencies will actually look or be aliases of the original frequencies. What's the folding frequency, omega sub s, omega sub f. That's just half the sampling frequency, isn't it? And what we can see from that is our highest frequency, which was 8, was bigger than our folding frequency, which was 5. And that's going to actually suggest or tell us that 8 will be aliased. Now, if you wanted to see this, maybe in terms of, well, how can, what, what do you mean alias? How come that frequency looks like a lower frequency? Here's a picture of that or an attempt at a picture of that. I have two waveforms sketched here. The dashed blue waveform, and that's at 1 hertz. And I have this green sinusoid, and that's at 9 hertz. But now if I sample at 10 hertz, and I've shown just one second, a one second interval here. If I now sample at 10 hertz, if I put 10 samples in one second, look what's happening relative to the 9 hertz waveform and the 1 hertz waveform. They align, don't they? And what do I know if I'm sampling at 10 hertz? What can I actually see or discern? What's the highest frequency that I could see? 5. So the best I can hope for is to see frequencies between DC and 5. There's no way I'm going to be able to distinguish a 9 hertz waveform. If you were looking at this, all you would see would be these stems. You'd cover everything up, and all you're seeing are those stems. If you're sampling 10 times a second, you're just taking this strobe right at those blue lines. And if you're doing that, what are you seeing? Well, the 9 looks identical to the 1, doesn't it? Because they are exactly the same in terms of value at those points that I'm sampling. 
meaning. Here I actually have the following. I have a one hertz waveform and I also have a nine hertz waveform. And I'm sampling at 10 hertz. What's my folding frequency in this example? That's 5 hertz. Now, can we derive or convince ourselves that that 9 will look like a 1? What do we know is happening? We know all we can hope for is to see things between 0 and 5. And we actually have something out here at 9. Now, if we virtually fold the paper on that crease at 5, at this folding frequency, where's that 9 going to appear? Right at 1. Yes, sir? Yes, so the this technique does work if your frequency, original frequency, is beyond omega sub s. Maybe it's around 3 omega sub s. You just have to fold your paper a few times. You may have to multi-fold. But where do you fold? You have these folding frequencies, and then you keep folding at those folding frequencies. But in this case, this distance is 4, and so that means that this guy is going to get aliased back 4 away from 5. Let's do one more problem. This way with the folding frequencies, and then maybe we'll talk well, let's see how much time is left. Suppose I give you y of t is 4 cosine of 3t plus 5 cosine of 8t. And now suppose that we sample. That looks familiar, doesn't it? Isn't that the same as x before? But now what we want to do, let's sample it slightly different. Let's sample at 12 radians per second. Are we going to see what we saw before? What did we see before? We saw 2 and 3 when we sampled at 10, right? Is that what we did in the last example? We sampled at 10 and we saw 2 and 3 as far as frequencies were concerned. Now we have the same original waveform, but now we're sampling at a different rate. We're sampling at 12. Can we sketch this? We have something at 3 and we have something at 8. Where are we sampling? There's our sampling, isn't it? What does that determine for us? That tells us where to fold our paper. We now go back here to half of that, which is 6, which is 6. And now what do we do? We fold the 8 over. And where's the 8 going to end up? This is now going to end up 2 below 6, or it's going to be at 4. So now we can have this guy over to 4. Questions on that? Yes.
yes, you could have a case where the question was, can you actually have in your original signal two unique frequencies and then sample at such a frequency to where they both look as look the same? And the answer is yes. Let me see. Maybe you had something at 15 hertz and maybe something at what do I want to say? 35 hertz. And you sample at 50 hertz. If any of that makes sense. Did that just work out? Let's say that we had a frequency F1 is 15. F2 is, what did I say, 35. And now I said, suppose we sample at 50. What do we have? What's our folding frequency? Now we have a 25 hertz folding frequency. And what's this F2's alias going to do? The apparent frequency for F sub 2, and maybe we'll do that, maybe we'll get that far, is you can take the original frequency, and then you can just start subtracting multiples of the sampling frequency to get at the apparent frequency or the alias frequency, meaning F sub 2 was 35. If we subtract 1 times F sub S, which is 50, what's this going to give me? Minus 15, but what's 15 look like? 15. So that's where we, that's going to give us something lying on top of it. Now, how could we start avoiding some of this? Now, hopefully you can see that if you're not careful, if somebody gives you a signal and you just arbitrarily sample it, if that original signal had some high frequencies in it, now after sampling, they're going to look like low frequencies. And you're going to go, ah, what's going on with my system? But what did we just uncover before? In those two examples, we had one frequency at 3 and something at 4. Here we had something at 3 but something at 2. So if you sampled at two different frequencies and one of those frequencies starts moving around on you, you know that it's an alias. Right? Because one time it was at 2, the next time you sampled slightly different, you sampled at 12 instead of 10, and now you got a frequency at 4, but that 3 stayed put. Now if you ended up with this guy, then you're out of luck unless you take a couple of more frequencies to worry about. Because now everything looks like 15 in this scenario. How can we start avoiding some of this? What have you learned in this class, if you wanted to eliminate frequencies, what would you do? Filter. So now you might anti-alias filter, which is really a low-pass filter. Suppose that somebody now gave you the following information. They maybe said, oh, I have some frequencies omega-1, omega-2, whoops, omega-3. sub Oh, and I have an omega-4, sub and I have an omega-5. sub But maybe they say, you know what? The only frequencies that I'm interested in are these. What do you want to do? You probably want to filter these W4, omega 4 and omega 5 and reduce them at least, attenuate their amplitude, right? Because then if they're smaller, if they do come back, they're going to be very small, hopefully. Meaning, you now might want to overlay on top of this. So 
these omegas might have been the x omega, but now what you say is you go, you know what, I'm going to low pass filter these. Then, after you've low pass filtered, then you sample. You don't do it the other way around. Prior to sampling, you want to low pass filter. Schematically, what we've now said is if we have this signal, x of t, and maybe it has frequencies of interest and non-interest, the first thing we want to do is put it through a low-pass filter, and then we can sample it to get x sub s of t. Questions on that? Yes. So now you have to, so the question was, do you have to, so where do you sample relative to the cutoff frequency of your low-pass filter? And that's going to be up to you. That's your design point, because you need to know how fast am I rolling off, what's omega sub 4, etc. And if you know what these frequencies are, if this was an ideal red filter, how slow could you sample? If you've now low-pass filtered, how slow could you sample and still get away with it? 2 omega sub 3. And that may not be related intimately to your low-pass filter cutoff. It's going to be related, but it depends on how sharp and what determines the sharpness of this roll-off. The filter order. You guys know all this. You guys are should be getting a lot of this. Now, are there other questions on this? Let's look at another way of maybe finding these aliases instead of getting out and doing origami and folding paper. We can do it more numerically, and I hinted at it before. Other ways for finding... aliases. One way is by applying the concept depicted in figure 8.9, meaning you might have a frequency axis f, and now what you know is if you sample at f sub s, you can immediately put those tick marks down, but what do you also know? You know that you can't tell anything below F sub S over 2. So that's a critical frequency. But anything below that, you can identify. So that's a linear line. This is now F sub S over 2. So this is, on this vertical axis, is your apparent frequency. Meaning, if you now looked at something that was between F sub S over 2 and F sub S, it would now, here's how to interpret this. Now you might have something here. You now go here and you say, oh, my apparent frequency, oh, it's a negative, but I know that that's the same as the positive. If you now continue to do this, I hope it's a terrible sketch, but this is now another multiple of F sub S over 2, meaning if your original frequency was way out here at 2 F sub S, you would go up here, and you would say, oh, apparently that looks is going to look like, because of aliasing, this value of F sub A. Does that make sense? You can also do this by an equation. You could also do this from equation, and this is what I had hinted at before, 
15a, if you now had your apparent frequency or the alias frequency, that's going to be coming from your original frequency minus some integer multiple of f sub s. And you want your f sub a to be ending up between f sub s over 2 and minus f sub s over 2. This is now your apparent frequency or the alias. F is your original frequency. M is some integer multiple. And so you just pick that M until F sub A lives in this interval. You just keep changing M until you get a number F sub A between F sub S over 2 and minus F sub S over 2. And now you have your uh, alias or your apparent frequency. F sub S is your sampling frequency. And hopefully that is consistent with what we've talked about in today's class. And you can look at how you can use this formula to do the same thing as your folding of paper. And this is doing the same thing as that earlier figure, figure 8.9. Questions on, the, oh gosh, I was going to give you the teacher course of 